Student Showcase, Part 2. Hi everyone, I'm Shashwat, a GSOC 2020 student working on the project Etisync Sync Backend for Econadi. My project is about adding a new sync functionality to KDPM apps. Uh, all KDPM apps that come under contact, like K Address Book and K Organizer, can currently sync the user's personal information through a variety of services, like Google Contacts, Google Calendars, Microsoft EWS, DAV Grouper so servers, uh, and others. So the aim is to add to this list a secure end-to-end -end encrypted open source sync solution called Etisync. So a little more about what Etisync is. So Etisync, as I said, is a secure end-to-end -end encrypted open source solution for your contacts, calendars, and tasks. Etisync clients are available for a number of platforms, including Android, iOS, uh, the desktop CalDAV CardDAV bridge, the web client, and a Thunderbird plugin has been developed recently. The server is also open source and can be self-hosted. Etisync integrates really well with your existing applications. Uh, for example, on Android, you could simply download the Etisync app and use your favorite calendar app to sync your Etisync events. Uh, now a little about Akonadi. So Akonadi is the backend framework for storage, indexing, and retrieval of the user's personal information, like uh, contacts, calendars, and tasks. So the benefit of Akonadi is that it provides a centralized system for uh, user data management. Otherwise, all PIM apps would have their own cache and data management. Uh, Akonadi provides an extensive client API to make development easier. One such implementation is called the Akonadi resource. So all external services that are integrated into contact, like, uh, as I said, Google, Microsoft, or the DAS servers, all these external services uh, have their resources, have Akonadi resources running, which interface between, the, between Akonadi and your server. So my work is to make a new resource to uh, enable native Etisync integration in Akonadi. Note that users could previously also use Etisync uh, by setting up the Etisync DAV bridge and using the DAV resource. But uh, my project enables native Etisync integration, which is clearly better. So the project status is that the resource is ready for beta testing, and we would love to have more testers. So do reach out if you're interested. I'll give a small demo of the working resource. So here I have K-Organizer open. I can add a calendar, and the Etisync entry shows up. So I'll add my test credentials. I have locally hosted the resource, uh, the server, and that's why this IP is a local IP. I enter my Etisync encryption password, and all the events get, uh, all the events are fetched. So we can also add a new event. Let's call this test event six, and we can go to the Etisync web client and refresh this to see that it has been fetched. So similarly, K address books syncs all your address books and contacts. So for example, if I delete this contact here, and if I go to the web client and refresh it, you can see the contact is deleted from Etisync. So there's a lot more than this demo shows, including journal addition collection, uh, journal addition modification deletion, and item modification. Uh, but that's it for this presentation. To know more about the project, you can uh, join the IRC channels hash Econadi and hash Etisync. Uh, you can read more about the project and the status updates on my blog or the Etisync blog, or you could also contact me directly. So thank you all. Thanks a lot for listening. Uh, that's it. Hi, uh, I'm myself, Shivam Balikondra. I worked uh, on adding file processing for Docs ID during season of KD uh, in year 2020 this summer. Uh, a little introduction about me. So I contributed for, uh, as I already said, I contributed for KD. And in the past, I also contributed for Chromium and Linux as well in Rust, C++, and related to compilers and operating systems. Coming back to my project work during this SOK. So 
first i'll start with the basic part so what are files so file is a collection of data when we structurally logically arrange this data into a hierarchical data structure then we have this respective file formats uh, in this case we went with kml file format so how about this file formats process first the rocks id opens the file imports it as a bit stream now from that stream it we we have file pa passes uh, written using qr passes uh, in abn notation grammar so using this grammar uh, the parser parses this uh, stream and creates a parse tree out of that uh, from this parse tree we can generate tokens which give the uh, real information data which is stored in the respective files or the respective file format which in this case it's the kml so coming to the work that was done during the sok for the first week uh, there was a debate regarding why was kml an important file format that was required in uh, rocks id so the reason was obvious because it was widely used it is widely used today and uh, it's user friendly and easy to read and visualize so that was the main reason behind this during this uh, my mentor saw donity helped me in guiding me through this entire project work uh, till now uh, after this first week the second and third weeks uh, were invested in discussing the file structure researching on other file formats and learning from them and uh, after the researching and uh, documenting an approach uh, on the right hand side as you can see uh, this this is the file structure of kml in rocks id that that is uh, for that we have implemented parser and grammar so using this parser and grammar we are able to import and process this file format and generate tokens out of it so that's the progress till now uh, and from the table you can see uh, get information regarding the various tags and the in, and the information the data that uh, the, these tags contain uh, coming up the rest part is integrating this parser with the graph engine which will import that tokens and create graph out of it and testing and documentation now uh, on the right side you can see i have this here a screenshot of uh, what will be the scale file structure look like like it will have graph track then types directed then IDs for nodes then color for this node then edge uh, defining the different edge from one node to another and connect to connect one node to other and its respective color representation in the visualization you can see a is directed to b and b is directed to c uh, the edges of blue and the node as well as blue with ids a b and c and on the left hand side we have the pass implementation that is currently implemented from the entire sok i learned it was quite a great experience for me i learned the value of open source uh, in software development then the positivity of community which helped young developers to get a head start in open source and making good contributions for it and also both c++ library and file processing which was my main interest behind this contribution so that's all from my side thank you hello everyone my name is paritosh and i am working on 
on a Qt 3D based backend for K stars in my Google Summer of Code 2020. My mentors are Mike Cruz and Jason Mutlak. And you can contact me using this. So let's begin. So first I'll start by introducing what a planetarium software is. It's simply a program which simulates the night sky at any location of the earth at any given time. And there are separate planetarium software such as Stellarium, K-Stars, SkyMap, formerly known as Google SkyMap. Now there are mo uh, mostly two parts to these planetarium softwares. The one part, it focuses on getting the data of the positions of the object in 3D, uh, 3D or 2D coordinates. And the second part is the drawing part, which actually draws the sky objects from the data. Now softwares like Stellarium, they are capable of drawing in 3D. However, other softwares like KStars, they currently only use a 2D based backend. For 2D, we have a popular backend known as QPainter. And there was also work on an OpenGL version. Right now, what we aim in this project is to add a 3D backend and which will be based on a Qt 3D based framework. So this is a brief overview of how KSTARS actually draws the sky objects. So as I said, there's a uh, there's a information bit or a data bit and a draw bit. So we have the information in KSTARS and we have a class known as sky map which is actually the widget on which everything is drawn. So SkyMap actually uh, can use either SkyMap QDraw or SkyMap GLDraw. And this QDraw, this actually is the QPainter based backend widget and the GLDraw is the open GL based backend widget. Again, we have something known as the SkyMap composite and and this is where everything is drawn. Uh, this controls the draw calls for each sky object. And this sky object is just a base class for e each and everything. This includes planets and uh, comets, moon, everything. The individual cl classes of these have the uh, draw call which could either either utilize uh, QPainter or OpenGL and this has been served using a common interface SkyPainter. Now since the SkyPainter draw calls which are called in the sky object class they occur at every paint event so we can't utilize Qt3D using this interface we can't do this. And the reason behind this is because Qt3D utilizes something known as scene graph as its drawing principle and which basically means you have to give all the information to Qt3D and it will handle the drawing. Thus the only solution to solving this problem is actually having uh, both initialization and update draw up, uh, draw calls in sky map composite and this means each and every sky object they needs to have these two calls and the initialization call it will be utilized to use uh, to initialize the scene graph and the update call will just change the transformation coordinates or anything related to projections or colors so this was what I suggested in the previous slide. We have a custom window which is derived from the Q3D window and each sky object it has the option to actually modify the Q3D window which uh, the custom window we have used here and this will have calls for everything. This include initializing some uh, sky object be it a planet or a moon or anything and even for updates update calls for all, all those 
so till now we mainly discussed the integration section that is how to integrate qt 3d inside k stars now we are talking about some technicalities related to uh, drawing as in using that backend to draw in 3d and this mainly covers two main topics which is astronomical projections and instance rendering so we generally when we use uh, 3d software or we play 3d games we actually use something known as perspective or orthogonal projection they however don't apply for astronomical so softwares and for astronomical softwares we have a set of six projections inside k stars these include lambert or eq rectangular etc now the main complexion was to employ the uh, you know these projections inside the shaders and when we are, when we are drawing it so instead of the x y or z coordinate which is served in uh, which is given to the s vertex position to the uh, vertex shader while drawing we have actually to, uh, have to give the right ascension and the declination of the sky object to the vertex shader and this will actually project it using one of the six projection uh, astronomical projections and project them on a 2d screen and then it is further given to the fragment shader which handles uh, the coloring etc so this was a difficult bit to tackle and was the main first uh, was the first problem in the drawing side the second problem is related to instance rendering so as k stars it can have uh, a lot of stars or a lot of st sky objects and we can't draw all of them individually by giving like separate buffers for every every time we send send shader info, info to a graphic card to solve this we use something known as instance rendering which is we give all the vertex positions and other shader information in the like that is the other shader parameters in just one buffer and it handles the drawing for multiple objects at the same time so instance rendering was utilized throughout k stars and most importantly when we are we use uh, it to draw stars and the grid so this can include the grid lines which are similar to latitude of latitude or longitude for planetarium softwares so for example for rendering stars we actually just place the points at the given that is ascension and declination uh, for that projection and then we pass in this happens in the vertex shader and then we pass it to a geometric shader which just summons a quadrilateral at that particular point and it has the texture for the star we want to draw and then it is passed to the fragment shader then the results and as you can see we have our sun we have a few red lines we have a few stars and so some keyboard and mouse actions are working right now this include this include zooming and uh, panning and changing projections or turning off the particular sky object similarly we have more textures and we'll add more 3d models for the other sky objects as well so this was my work and thank you and you are free to ask any queries that you have hello everyone my name is anuj bansal and i'm a final year undergraduate student from india i have been working with the kde web team since december 2019 and i'm currently working on improving the web infrastructure for kde as part of google summer of code 2020 my GSOC project consists of two parts. As the first part of my project, I worked on porting KDE's main website, kde.org, to Hugo. The website is currently built using PHP. Now, the website for the most part is a static website. 
and the parts of it that are dynamic like the applications page have already been built as a subsite so it doesn't make a lot of sense to use php for it there's also a lot of problems like slow build times and the need for manual work for example the list of announcements on the website is built manually by adding each announcement to a list this is where hugo comes into play Hugo is a static site generator based on Golang and provides great speed and flexibility. It solves many of the problems with the PHP site. It allows us to construct layouts which reduce the amount of duplicate code. For example, every announcement on only changes slightly from the other ones, so we can have a layout that has the dynamic part inserted into it. There are also Hugo shortcodes that are sort of like functions that provide some syntactic sugar. I can use the single line of code uh, to embed a YouTube video into a page and we can also create some custom shortcodes for some functionality. I am happy to say that this part of my project is now complete and is now being tested after which it can be deployed. The second part of my project involves a complete revamp of the season of KDE website. The website now looks much more modern and mobile friendly. The website now also uses the new OAuth based identity service that is currently being built by my mentor Carl. Some of the new functionality on the website includes a nice and easy to use admin panel, badges assigned to students and mentors and the support for multiple mentors for a project. One of the most helpful new features I believe would be the new markdown support. The students can have much more detailed and nice looking proposals. Some of the students may remember some random HTML being added to their proposal from last year. Currently, I am working on adding the ability for the mentors and students to be able to comment on the proposals for feedback and also automatic certificate generation at the end of the program. Finally, I would like to say that it has been a wonderful experience contributing to the KDE community. That's all from me. Thank you so much for listening to me. Have a wonderful day.